Okay, we have an amazing site visit lined up for you today. We are going on site to the Hunley in Charleston, South Carolina, to see something you probably didn't even think existed, an attack submarine from the 1800s. Okay, okay, not that submarine from the 1800s. This one is for real. But as you'll see, the Hunley actually does bear some resemblance to Jules Verne's Nautilus. However, it represents not just an amazing breakthrough in naval technology and history, but one of the most uh, incredible marine archaeology projects ever completed. And it's got all the classic hallmarks of a whodunit in terms of who actually sank the Hunley and how it sank to who discovered it, because there's even some dispute about that. Uh, there's all the complexities about who funds the archaeology, who does the archaeology. So a lot of the topics we've been discussing here on Into the Dust. We're going to start with a little history of submarines. So if you want to skip past that part, you can go straight to the visit where I'm going to take you on site to the Hunley in Charleston, South Carolina. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this very special living archaeology site visit. The Hunley is not just a marvel of naval technology and a really cool technological invention. It actually represents the human spirit's conquest of new frontiers and our insatiable desire to always push the envelope, to push the limits, to take it to the next level as a species. The idea of a submersible vehicle is as old as antiquity. In fact, there is a myth uh, about Alexander the Great in his quest for knowledge and seeking to explore, you know, the, the known world which he had conquered. Well, he went uh, up into the air on the wings of some birds that he harnessed, but he also first went below the water in sort of a diving bell type of thing uh, and explored under the sea. Now, this became a myth actually in the medieval times because they revered Alexander the Great as the consummate warrior, king, and scholar. Now, if this sounds familiar to you, we actually discussed this uh, in the context of the Alfred Jewel, because there are some pretty convincing arguments that actually depicts not uh, Christ, but Alexander the Great harnessing those birds. This is the other half of that myth where he goes underneath the water. Now, of course, diving bells didn't come about until the 15 and 1600s, which is where we're going to fast forward to with William Bourne. Now, in 1578, when Queen Elizabeth I was on the throne, he developed the first sort of engineering plans for a submarine that was able to submerge through changing of the volume of the vessel. There is a relationship between pressure, which is what causes submarines to submerge nowadays, and volume, so that's the other half of that equation. That's Boyle's Law, which was not even invented at that time yet, but anyway, this is not a science show, it's an archaeology show. So yes, William Bourne came up with a engineering design of a submarine uh, sometime later, 50 years later in 1620, Cornelius Drebbel, who was a Dutchman, but also operating in England, had an idea for a submarine that he actually built. So that was the first prototype. It was a wooden vessel covered in leather to make it waterproof. And he was marketing that to the Royal Navy and it worked. He was able to submerge for three hours. He went from one end of London to the other, from Westminster, where Big Ben is, all the way to Greenwich, which is where the headquarters of the Royal Navy is. And it was such a sensation that it was captured in art of the time. There's a famous painting of the submarine with St. Paul's Cathedral in the background, which is not far from where I live. Now, the submarine was rowed, and it became such a sensation that the king at the time, who had taken over for Elizabeth, James I, he rode in the submarine, making him the first uh, leader ever, national leader, to ride in a submarine. That started a whole sort of mini bomblet of submarine designs and prototypes over the next 50, 60 years. It wasn't until 1747 Nathaniel Simmons developed a submarine prototype which used ballast, and this is the modern era of submarine design. Ballast has to do with flooding compartments in a submarine, uh, which affects the pressure and that causes it to dive. So that happened in 1747. 
Just to 25, 30 years later, during the American Revolution, this went into practice. So the British conquered New York City in 1776. Uh, they made it their headquarters. But George Washington, thanks to his culper ring, which was a spy ring that he operated in New York City, the governor of Connecticut, Governor Trumbull, passed this uh, idea for a submarine onto Washington, which was built. It operated in New York Harbor and attempted to attach explosives to Royal Navy vessels. It didn't work, but it operated for a while. And then it was on, uh, on board a ship for transport, which was attacked and sank by the Royal Navy. So that was the first submarine to be used in warfare. Now, if we fast forward four score and seven years, like Lincoln said to the Civil War, uh, that's what brings us to the Hunley, which represented the next big milestone in uh, submarine warfare. And I always say like, if you were in town that day, you know where you were when the Huntley was raised. The bridge stopped, Yorktown stopped, like everything just stops. It really is, it's, it's amazing. There are parts of the hull that still remain almost as, as they were over 150 years ago. Here we are at the Hunley. This is an amazing place to visit, my favorite place in Charleston. Now, right around us, you'll see all kinds of nautical sort of things. Uh, this is actually part of the port um, this is the Warren Lash Conservation Center, where the Hunley is kept. We are here at the Hunley, uh, and I'm speaking to one of their master docents, Jamie. Uh, and we're going to get into a little bit of the site. So, Jamie, nice to meet you. A pleasure meeting you as well. How long have you been a docent here? I started about seven years ago. And I think you're all volunteers, right? We are. So what got you into wanting to volunteer here? When my wife and I moved to uh, to Charleston about 10 years ago, both my wife and I were semi-retired, so I needed something to do. I've always been really interested in, in history, and Charleston is such a fantastic place for history. I came across the Hunley here. They were looking for volunteers, and it, it was a perfect fit for me. Charleston really is a, like a history theme park. You know, in, in America here, it's hard to find things that are older than the 1800s, and we've got a lot of 1600s here. We're here to talk about uh, one of the oldest submarines around, and that's the first thing I wanted to ask you, because there's that submarine, the Turtle, from the American Revolution. What is this the actual first of? What's the record that the Hunley holds? The Hunley holds the record for being the first submarine to attack and sink another ship. In, in the middle of the, uh, the, the 19th century, in the middle of the Civil War, there was a group of guys down in New Orleans that put together the idea of building a man-powered submarine for the purpose of attacking and sinking Union blockade ships. So in February 17th of 1864, you're in Charleston, the Clunley with its crew of eight attacked and sank the USS Housatonic, thereby becoming the world's first successful attack submarine. Before that night, no submarine had ever sank another ship, but that night the Hunley was the first. Everyone knows Fort Sumter and Castle Pinkley. So where's the fun of lake? The Warren Lash Conservation Center is up off the, uh, off the map here. Where the Hunley was found was, uh, this is Sullivan's Island, which is the, the barrier island just on the northern uh, edge of the mouth of the harbor. The Housatonic that the Hunley sank was four miles off the beach of Sullivan's Island. And when the Hunley was discovered in 1995, it was a thousand feet further out to sea from where the Housatonic sank. Obviously, they didn't know what happened to the Hunley. Right. Is that potentially also the seeds of the destruction of the Hunley? It detonated something that was actually kind of attached to it in some way. Is there a chance that the, the blasts also damaged the Hunley and sank it with the Housatonic? Th that is a distinct possibility. The spar was still attached to the boat. In fact, they had to detach the spar before they could raise the hunley. Okay. When they detached the spar, when they started to raise it up, it actually broke into two pieces. So, oh, so okay. the spar is now in actually two pieces. So the thinking was that the way it would work is that the hunley would kind of come in hot, ram the their target, embed this barb into the wooden hull of the ship, and then back away leaving the bar when we got the spar into the lab and started looking at it we, we saw a couple of interesting things 
One, this is the end where the, the, the torpedo was connected. The end of it is gone. But also, this, this material here that kind of looks like leather, mm. it's actually copper. Okay. Uh, and it shows signs of being forced. Yep. Um, so, uh, this is evidence of the force of the torpedo pushing this, this copper sheathing back. So, that told us that we know that the spar was still attached to the to the the Hunley uh, at the attack because it was still attached when we recovered it. Mm. This tells us that the torpedo was still attached to the spar mm. when it exploded. Got it. So so that that meant that they didn't leave the torpedo embedded in the the wooden hull of the ship and backed away. Yep, it just blew up at the, right then and there. Exactly. And I guess then that's where we're talking about the experimental archaeology about how much force that would have created. Would that have knocked the men out? Would that have damaged the ship, right? The yes. explosion at that distance. Oh. Exactly. We're still trying to figure out, you know, exactly what happened. But the possibility that the torpedo either damaged the Hunley itself or perhaps even injured crew uh, is, is a possibility. But that's just one of several possibilities. Charleston was founded in 1670, and there's a lot of stuff that's still around from that time. There was some discussion about when the Hunley was really found. The Hunley was really found on May 3rd, 1995. What about the argument that uh, it was supposedly discovered in the 70s? The Hunley was really found on May 3rd, 1995. Okay. That's according to the Navy. That's according to the National Park Service. Air, the waters around Charleston, partly because of all the history, uh, there's a lot of stuff on the bottom of the, the seafloor. There are old shipwrecks. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff on the bottom that would trigger a magnetometer. So uh, when Custer and, was looking for it, they would drag their magnetometer through the water back and forth. Uh, and every time they passed over a, a large metal object, they would stop, diver would put on his gear, go down and investigate to see uh, what it was. And they found a lot of other stuff. Mr. Custer and his crew, they actually found it in 1994 but they didn't realize they'd found it. Oh, okay. Uh, so then in 1995, when they came back down for the summer, you know, search season, they went back and looked at some of the uh, the hits they had gotten the year before uh, that looked really promising. This time they went back and looked at those and and uh, confirmed that it was the it was indeed the Hunley. Okay, understood. Um, and I guess they had to keep it on the hush hush for quite a while. They did. Mr. Custer did an interesting thing. When he found it, he knew that there were going to be a tremendous amount of interest in the Hunley, uh, and he wanted to make sure that the Hunley was protected. So when he found it, he announced that he had that he had located it. It was confirmed that it was indeed the Hunley, but then he wouldn't tell anybody where it was until kind of the the outline of a, a plan had been put together for exactly what was going to happen to it. Yeah. As soon as he announced that the Hunley had been found, there were claims of ownership. Yep. That that popped up, uh, and there were there were legal questions that had to be answered. There were there were political issues that had to be worked out. It took them a while to give the coordinates up, just and not for any reason, but just because they want to make sure it was going to be handled properly. Mm -hmm. They were not treasure hunters or anything like that. So their state, <clears throat> excuse me, with the state Hunley Commission, or friends of the Hunley, were the nonprofit um, side of it, which was started in 1997 by the, the Hunley Commission, and then you just had you know, legislators, Navy, all the things. I mean, you had SCIA, which is, I'm not going to say this right, it's the South Carolina Institute of Anthropology and Archaeology. They were very involved on the um, initial recovery. Do you know why the decision was made for it to be raised at all? And the, the reason I'm asking that is the following. There's usually a preference to preserve things in situ as long as they're not threatened. And oftentimes things are safe and sound under the water. Was it raised just because people thought it would be of historical interest, or was there actually a threat to it down there with tides or something? I, th I think it was, in part, uh, it was raised because, uh, because of the feelings that, that if, if left where it was, eventually it would just be, be eaten away and, and gone forever. Now, the raising and the preservation must have been, is, is very, very delicate. So what can you tell us about that, how it was raised brought a few miles to this location and then how is it being preserved there there were real concerns about the condition of the hull because it's an iron boat uh, an iron throne so exactly 
uh, and it had been soaking in muddy salt environment, salt water for, by the time it was, it was recovered, 136 years. So it had been in that, that environment for all those years, and we weren't sure how, how what, it, what shape it was going to be in. Uh, so a great deal of, of study went into exactly how to do this, how to pick this, you know, 40 foot long iron boat, uh, how to get it up. And it was, it was on the seafloor, but it was also buried uh, under the, uh, the, the, the seafloor by about three feet. And I guess a mud is right? mud, yeah. it's, it's mostly mud. Uh, and there were, you know, visions of trying to lift this, this artifact up off the seafloor and have it just fall apart, have it crumble. Efforts were made to do it in such a way that to preserve the, the hull. This is a model of, of how they did it. These, these bladders they put underneath, attached them to this big structure. And then when they got ready to raise the hunting, they picked up the entire structure, set it on the barge. And but that must have been a real moment there because it had to emerge out of the water, right, for a moment. Is that correct? Yes. So that must have been a very nervous moment. It was a nerve-wracking moment. Got it. Until it was set down on the uh, on the on the barge, and on the, the barge, barge, was, yeah. barge was moving yep. with the waves. Uh, the, the crane anchoring or lifting the uh, the whole structure was actually uh, had legs that went down into the seafloor, so it was steady. Yeah, very very but steady. The, the the barge was was tossing with oh. the, with the waves. So I hope it was a calm day. <laughs> fairly calm. Once they got all these bladders attached to the structure, they filled them with a, a material like liquid styrofoam. Thought it been the and once the styrofoam set up, it, it actually made the bladders conform to the, the shape of the hull rather than putting like straps underneath and make the, try to force the hull to fit in the, the shape of the strap. So, so um, then when they got ready to recover it, they just lifted the entire structure up with the Hunley slung underneath, just lifted it up, set it on the barge, towed the barge a few miles upriver. So who was actually in charge then of the excavation of, uh, you know, lifting it out? And that would be Friends of the Hunley. At the time, they worked very closely with, you had our, our chairman, but also the project director was from the Navy. And so it was, seem, you know, it was very much a partnership. If they were any biologists, then they were all the scientists. Then you had also the National Park Service. So the day of the raising, there was there wasn't a acronym that wasn't involved. <laughs> so to say, but they were um, the friends of the Hunley overall managed it, and then you just had all the other entities under that that was managed overall by friends of the Hunley. What I'm just thinking is money, because in terms of archaeology, you know, there are things all over the world under the ground that are known about, but there's just not money to excavate it. Right. You talk about underwater, you raise all those costs times 10, right? Absolutely, so absolutely. paid for all of this? So back in the day, and this is, you got to think this was in 2000, um, you know, 24 years ago, uh, we did have some funding from the federal government initially under the legacy funds because uh, the raising was very, very expensive. As you can imagine, as you said, if it was above ground, it wouldn't have been so much. So we got legacy funds from from the federal government. We also had some early on some state funding, but that was early on. We haven't had any of those probably over 20 years. Friends of the Hunley, we have our tours. We rely on that. We also rely on our membership program, fundraisers, and our donors. The public engagement is... Absolutely. That is what keeps us afloat. Now, this is a model of the Hunley. What was it made for? Yes, it was made uh, uh, by TBS to make the movie back in 1995. We were released in 1995, D.H.L. Hunley. This is half of the movie prop. It was used uh, in the filming of the movie. So cut in half. Now, it looks pretty cramped, pretty dark in there, but this is actually bigger than the Hunley was, right? It is. Uh, this is about uh, 15 to 20% bigger than the actual Hunley. The actual Hunley was 48 inches by 42 inches. Well, this is uh, about 15, 20% bigger. So I'm going to get inside now. And so it had this big crank. That would be forward. This is to move the ship forward. And then backward, you're sort of pulling. And, so, and this is... Turns the, turns the prop in the other direction. Got it. So forwards and backwards. So in order to make its attack, it would have planted the explosive on the spar and then backed up. Yep, this is hard work and it's loud work and it's dark work. The, the hull of the Hunley is in 
amazingly good shape. There's no damage to the hull that we can look at and say, you know, it looks like it was damaged in the in the blast and the attack. So there's the, the boom or whatever it is, the force of that may have knocked the crew out and then it got out of control or something. There have been tests done since the sinking that indicate the crew may have been still functioning after the attack. And I'll just break in for a moment there. That's called experimental archaeology. When something is difficult to explain, a lot of times what archaeologists do is just try to simulate what it was and see what happens. So I guess there's been a bunch of that with the Hundley. There has. The, uh, the, the Navy has done some, some uh, uh, testing using black powder on a, a scale model of the, uh, of the Hunley to try to determine what effect a, a, a large explosive device made of black powder uh, would have on the, uh, on the hull or, or on the crew. The test that the Navy has done indicated that the, the effect on the effect on the, the Hunley may not have been uh, quite as much as, as you might think. The inside of it tells us there was no a sense of urgency. The two pump systems, if you think they're bilging water out, those were not in that setting whatsoever. There are kill blocks located at the very bottom outside of the submarine. There's latches on the inside of an emergency system. If they need, needed to float up quickly to the top, they could disengage these um, kill blocks. They drop to the ocean floor and they the Hunley would rise to the top quickly. And those were not engaged at all. But it, it didn't see any sense of panic. When we recovered the Hunley, brought it into the lab, all those viewports were still uh, intact except one. There was one that's on the port side of the forward conning tower that where the viewport should have been was a hole about the size of a grapefruit. Mm. Uh, so how that hole came to be, what happened there, it is, a, is a little bit of a mystery. So it was brought here very carefully. Tell me about the preservation process. After the honey was discovered, during the time, the time between when it was discovered and when it was raised, the conservation lab here was set up on the, uh, this is the, the, the old, what used to be the old Charleston Navy Yard. Uh, so they built a water tank to keep it in, 75,000 gallon tank, but to help uh, preserve it while the research was being done, while the, 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 the layer of concretion that had had kind of collected on pod every on everything inside and out while all that could be done so uh, then in uh, several years uh, uh, after that started uh, and uh, the honey was was uh, in the in the tank of fresh water uh, they added sodium hydroxide to the water to a, a level of about one percent and the sodium hydroxide helps to leach these salts out of the iron okay because over the years the, the iron absorbs a tremendous amount of salt from the from the seawater. The sodium hydroxide acts on a molecular level to help leach those salt out of the out of the iron. So, and that's a, it's a very slow process. It's been going on for years, and it probably will take another few years before it's completely. And that's what I was going to ask you. There is a time limit. Do we have any sense of when that should be? It's probably not known exactly, but it, it's not known exactly. What we've been told is that the 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 salts are still coming out of the iron, and and the the hull will let us know when it's when it's okay to uh, got it. And um, what is going to happen then? Does it have to stay in water? Or will it actually be able to be put in a dry environment? The the hope is that the hull will be in in good enough shape that once it's uh, once it's have a, a protective coating on it, that it will be able to be displayed outside of a tank of water in a uh, a glass enclosure uh, with some uh, with a an inert gas like argon to to protect the the metal. Okay, so no rides on the Hundley ever, but it might be out of the Pro water. Probably not. Okay, great. Okay, so sorry to disappoint you guys. No uh, rides on the Hundley anytime soon, but you will definitely want to visit there because as you've heard, uh, anytime you excavate anything under the water, that multiplies the time and the cost times a gajillion. So your visit will help to fund the ongoing uh, research uh, and preservation of the Hundley. And not only that, it will help to prove the financial viability of these types of archaeological projects so they take place in the future to help preserve our shared heritage. Now, uh, of course, when you visit Charleston, South Carolina, which is something I would seriously recommend as it's a city full of history, it looks like a you know, set piece from uh, Gone with the Wind. You can, of course, visit uh, Fort Sumter, where the American Civil War broke out, 
lots of historic homes downtown where they're Revolutionary War sites, uh, the plantations around Charleston where you can learn about the history of enslavement into the uh, United States, and you can even have a drink at the bar where the pirate Blackbeard used to frequent. However, I do seriously recommend you do leave the charming confines of downtown Charleston, South Carolina, and drive just a couple miles north to drop by the Hundley. It's definitely something you won't regret. So that's another Into the Dust archaeology site visit. Hey, if you like what you heard, give me that thumbs up below, hit that bell to subscribe, or if you want to support more independent archaeology content, consider contributing to my Patreon, where you can enjoy some exclusive members-only benefits and other goodies. Until the next dig.